good morning again. So how many of you have your ropes? How many of you have been holding your rope? All right, now remember, remember we, um, and I, you don't have to actually have the rope to hold the rope, all right? But remember, three weeks ago, we promised to pray for Amy. We promised to pray for Bebe and Moise. We promised to pray for Haley and Delaney to hold that rope and lift them up in prayer. And uh, they are... They are dependent upon my prayers and your prayers. Not sure if you, if you heard, there was a terrorist attack in Ivory Coast this week, which borders on Burkina Faso, and uh, still listed as one of the most dangerous countries in the world, all right? And so they desperately need you and I to hold our ropes. And so let me please encourage you to be faithful uh, in praying for them, and not only just for, for Amy and the family, but for each of our missionaries as they serve around the world. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Did we get our technology working again. I thought, I thought we were going to have to go old school and actually look at Bibles this morning. And um, uh, if you have your Bible, your device, your phone, your iPad, your desktop computer in front of you, whatever you have, Whatever you have, uh, look at that as we study uh, God's Word together. Well, today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Uh, we don't say too much about it, and quite frankly, we don't have palms up here, but today we do remember and celebrate Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is traditionally the Sunday before Easter, and it commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. You're probably familiar of the events of the story. Jesus asked two of his disciples to go and, and find a, a donkey, actually the colt of a donkey that had never been written by man, and they go and miraculously the donkey is right where Jesus says it was, and they bring it back to Jesus, and Jesus mounts the donkey and rides into the city of Jerusalem to the adulation and the worship of the crowds. If you're familiar with the story, the crowds lined the streets of Jerusalem and waved their palm branches, and some of them put down their clothes for Jesus to ride on, and they cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to uh, the highest. And on that day, Jesus received the reception of a king, as if Jesus was coming to be coronated as the king of the Jews. Unfortunately, though, you know the story. Just a few days later, that praise and that worship did not last very long because just a few days later, many of those same people who had cried out words of praise to Jesus were in the crowd, at least, when they were yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. We know that Jesus was not coronated king on that moment, but Jesus, just a few days later, was, was crucified, was buried, and as we will celebrate next Sunday, he rose again. And so I read that story, and, and you're like me. I kind of ask myself the question, how is it possible? How is it possible that, that they could be praising Jesus one day and cursing him just a few days later? How could they want to crown him as king on Sunday, but by Friday not really want him to be a part of their lives? So much so that they desired, they were willing at the very least, that he be crucified. I read that in my mind, I think, oh my word, that sounds absolutely unthinkable. How could you do such a drastic flop where one day you're praising him and the next day you're cursing him? As I thought through that though, quite frankly, I realized that if we're not careful, it's easy for us to do the exact same thing. Now, by saying that, I'm not insinuating that anybody here desires for Jesus to be crucified and would yell out for him to be crucified. But if we're not careful, it's easy for us to praise him on Sunday and use that same mouth to curse during the week. Maybe even to take his name in vain. James says it this way, out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, that is not the way that it should be. 
You see, it's easy for us to worship Jesus on Sunday, but live as if he does not exist during the week. Maybe so much so that we don't want him to be a part of our lives. If we're not careful, it's easy for us to make a distinction between life and worship. It's easy for us to say, man, you know, worship is what I do on Sundays. The rest is what I do with the rest of my life. Well, in the passage that we're studying this morning, Jesus talks about the importance of our actions matching up with our words. Jesus talks about the importance of actually living out what it means to be a Christian, not only declaring it, not only singing it, not only talking about it, but living it out with our actions and our reactions, our words and our responses. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 16 today. Matthew chapter 5, beginning to verse 13, you're probably familiar with these verses. Jesus says this, you are the salt of the earth. Now, let me just pause for a second. The word you is emphatic in the verse. That, that's the word that's emphasized. Jesus is saying you. And the term is not singular. The term is plural. He wasn't just talking to that crowd that was gathered together on a hillside, a Galilean hillside there by the Sea of Galilee, but he was talking to them, and as the message transcends through time, he's talking to each and every one of us. He's not just talking to pastors, he's not just talking to missionaries, but he's talking to you, and he's talking to me. In other words, he says that we are the salt of the earth. As a matter of fact, would you say that with me today? Say it with me. We are the salt of the earth. Say it one more time. We are the salt of the earth. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? In other words, if salt ceases to function as salt, how can it become salt again? is what Jesus is asking. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Notice verse 14. You are the light of the world. The you is emphatic. The you is plural. Jesus is not just talking to a group of people gathered on a Galilean hillside. He's talking to you and me. He's not just talking to pastors and missionaries. He's talking to all of us. We are the light of the world. Say that with me today. We are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp And put it under a basket, but they placed it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, man, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to meet together. Lord, I don't know about everyone else, but for me, this has been such a busy week. And Lord, I'm sure for some of our folks here, it's been not only a busy week, but it's been a stressful week. Maybe even for some, a difficult week. And what a blessing it is for us to meet together with fellow believers who understand our struggles and understand, Lord, even some of the battles that we're going through. But much more importantly, Thank you that you're here with us today. Thank you that you've promised that whenever just a handful of people gather together, that you are there in the midst of them. So God, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to sense your presence today. Lord, help us to realize that the great teacher, the Holy Spirit of God is here. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would use your word and Lord, use the, uh, the words of Brian Father, to help us understand the truth of this passage, not only to understand it, but to live it out this week. 
Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to show us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so we're studying a series on the Sermon of the Mount that we've simply called Flipped. And the idea very simply is that Jesus wants to take our idea, our concept of what life is all about, and he really wants to turn it upside down. And he's really showing us a completely different way to live that's countercultural, that even goes against at times, many times, our wants and our desires. So we're going to see in just the next few weeks, over and over again throughout the series, he uses the phrase, you have heard that it was said. In other words, you think you should live this way, but I say to you. And Jesus takes that, that, that modern concept, even that traditional Christian concept, and turns it upside down and says, here's the way that I really expect you to live. We begun our series studying the Beatitudes, these, uh, these wonderful declarations that Jesus has given to his followers that not only instruct and show them how to live, but, but, but give them blessings for living that way. You'll be reminded that he talks about blessed are the poor in spirit because yours is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are you who mourn for you'll be comforted. And over and over again, he reiterates blessings. You'll inherit the earth. You'll be satisfied. You'll receive mercy. You will see God. And as Brad spoke about last week, you shall be called the sons of God. Incredible blessings that God gives to us. Well, the great blessings of verses 3 through 12 lead to the great responsibilities of verses 13 through 16. Did you catch that? Because blessings are always accompanied by responsibilities. Now, that's difficult for us because we want to receive without having to actually do. Anybody have teenagers in your house? All right. I love teenagers, but I know when my boys were teenagers, you know, we struggle. We say, listen, and you've probably had this conversation too. We feed you seven times a day. We feed you. You know, we put a roof over your head. We give you clothes, all right? We've given you a cell phone. We've given you all. Can you please just make your bed in the morning? You ever had that conversation? Um, probably so. Um, the challenge is this, with blessings come what? Responsibilities. And so here in the passage, Jesus having reiterated these tremendous blessings that we call the Beatitudes, now talks about our responsibilities. Here's the second truth, and these are in your notes. The, the Beatitudes are not to be lived in a vacuum, in other words, we've talked about these, these different ways that God desires for us to live. God doesn't just desire for us to live that way in the privacy of our own home. To the contrary, we are to live out those truths in our daily experience. We're to live it out at work. We're to live it out at school. We're to live it out in the neighborhood. We're to live it out on the golf course. We're to live it out in the mall. We're to live it out when we're shopping and people are cutting in front of us and someone actually has 20 items in the 18 item line and you're there and you're wanting to pull your hair out but it's at those moments that we are called to live out the beatitudes see see here's what Jesus is saying not only in this passage but throughout the sermon of the mount he's saying that we as believers are called to influence our generation with the gospel we are called to influence, to impact our generation with the truth of the gospel. I, I'm sure you thought about this, but did you ever wonder why after you became a, a believer, God just didn't take you home? I mean, you know, you were saved whenever that was that you realized that you were a sinner and you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. If his only purpose for you was to get you saved so that you could go to heaven, the moment that happened, it would make sense that all of a sudden this heavenly transport would come down. You know, Mr. Burkholder, it's time for you to go to heaven. Thank you very much. Take me to heaven. My job's done because he accomplished in my life what he wanted to accomplish. He got me to heaven. Praise the Lord. But that's not his only goal for you and me. His goal for us is for us 
to make a difference in the world in which we live. And for that reason, he has kept us here. Not only has he kept us here, but he has put you and me in the exact location where he wants us to be salt and light. Did you ever sit back and wonder, why in the world did God place me in this family? (laughs) Or why in the world do I have to work this job? Or of all the schools in South Florida, why do I have to attend this school? Did you ever wonder about that? Well, God has divinely placed you where he wants you to shine. God has divinely placed you where he wants you to live and where he wants you and me to make an impact. Well, in these verses, Jesus mentions several truths. The first truth is implied. The next three are explicitly declared. So I want you to see the first truth that's implied in the passage. If you're following along in your notes, the first truth is it's it's a reality. The world is getting worse. The world is getting worse. Now, I know that might sound like a doom and gloom statement, You might say, hey, Brian, I didn't come here this morning to be depressed. (laughs) I came here this morning to be encouraged. Well, the reality is that the world in which we live is getting worse. It's not getting better. Now, some would argue that and say, what are you talking about, Brian? It's getting better. Why? We have microwaves and we have cell phones. Why are we are living what George Jetson only dreamed about years ago? I mean, whoever thought that we could actually, my son lives in Guatemala, and he, I, and he can call me and I can see him on the phone while I'm driving. We can look at each other. Brian, the world's not getting worse. The world's getting better. Oh, we're so much smarter than we were in previous generations. Why, today, we can travel the world. You and I could hop on a plane, and by tomorrow morning, we could be in Africa, or we could be in different places. Brian, isn't the world getting better? You know the answer to that. And so do I. The world is not getting better. The world is getting farther and farther away from Jesus Christ. Let me, let me show you two verses or several verses that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Notice what Paul says. But understand this, Timothy, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of themselves. Now, hold a second. You think when Paul wrote that, he was kind of looking through the ages and he, in his vision, saw this thing called a selfie stick and didn't have any idea what it was, but he was talking about people being lovers of themselves. He says, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Catch this one. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Jump down to verses 12 and 13 of that same chapter. Paul says, indeed, As a result, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Brad preached about that last week. Notice what Paul says, though. While evil people and imposters will go from, what does Paul say? From bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. What does Paul tell Timothy? The world is not getting better. The world is getting worse. If you speak Spanish, my Argentine friend, Claudio Jimenez, says says this, the world is going from Guatemala to Guatepeor, all right? You have to be Spanish to understand that one. I'll I'll explain that to you later. Hey, listen, Paul is saying the same thing that Jesus is saying. The world is not getting better. Jesus makes two suppositions in the passage, all right? And they're in your notes. The first supposition that Jesus makes is this. The world is corrupt, and it's in the process of decay, all right? He, 
He assumes that based upon saying the believers are the salt of the earth, and we'll talk about our responsibility. But he tells us we're salt. Why? Because the world in which we live is corrupt, and the world in which we live is rapidly decaying, and the world in which we live desperately needs salt to stop the corruption that exists. The second supposition that Jesus makes is this. The world is in need of light and getting increasingly darker. The world in which we live is in need of light and getting increasingly darker. Listen, you know as well as I do that the sins that in previous generations were only talked about behind closed doors are now seen on movie screens and television screens around the world. And that which was done in private is now celebrated in our culture. Jesus says this, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. You say, Brian, why is that? Because man is infected with a deadly virus that is called sin, which has no cure apart from Jesus Christ. You see, the answer to society's problems is not a new program. It's not a political party. It's not even a new president. And I'm so grateful for the fact that we have the privilege to vote in our country. But a new political party, a new president, a new game plan is not what our country needs. Our world needs Jesus Christ. That is the message that Jesus is communicating there to his followers on the Sea of Galilee. And that is what Jesus communicates to us today. The reality, the world is not getting better. The world is getting worse. There's a second thing that Jesus brought out in the passage, and this is where it applies to us. He not only talked about a reality, but he talked about the influence. And here's what Jesus is saying. As believers, we can impact the world Yes, the world is getting worse, but that doesn't mean that you and I cannot have a positive influence on the world in which we live. Yes, the world's a mess. Yet the world, or yes, the world is in trouble. But the good news is, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we have been left here for a purpose. We have been given a mission, and we have been given the means to impact the world with the power of the gospel. Jesus here in this passage uses two metaphors to explain our mission. Two metaphors to explain what he desires for each of us individually and all of us corporately to accomplish. The first metaphor is this. You are the salt of the earth. Now, although salt is important in the day and age in which we live, it does not carry near the significance that it had during ancient times and during New Testament times. Ancient Greeks, or the ancient Greeks called salt theon, which means divine. I mean, they looked up to salt so much that to them it was a divine ingredient, something that God had specifically given to them. The Romans held that except for the sun, nothing was more valuable than salt. As a matter of fact, Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. They they weren't paid with money. They were paid in salt. By the way, it was from that practice that the expression came, that person's not worth their salt. You've heard that before. That soldier is not worth the salt that he is being paid. You see, Jesus' listeners would have understood salt to represent an extremely valuable commodity. So when Jesus told his listeners, you are the salt of the earth, and he tells us that we are the salt of the earth, what exactly did Jesus mean? Let me give you three applications, and I believe there's more, but let me give you three. The first is this. As salt, we as believers should create thirst. As salt, we should create thirst. You you get that. You you eat something salty, and you immediately want something to drink. Do you not? You ever eaten pork? 
And, and a few minutes later, a few hours later, it's like, man, I'm so thirsty. I can't figure out why I'm thirsty. Well, well, I've eaten something that has been cured with salt. Or maybe, maybe you ate popcorn. The other night, Vicki and I were watching a movie, and she made me this great big bowl of popcorn. And she said, Brian, you want something to drink? And I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need anything to drink. And within a few minutes, I was getting up to get something to drink. Why is that? Because popcorn makes you thirsty. Why does popcorn make you thirsty? Because it's got a lot of salt in it. At least if it's good popcorn, it has a lot of salt in it, right? It's got a lot of salt in it. got a lot of butter in it. And she put this other, what was the other thing you put on it? It was really good, but it was some type of thing on it that was really good, but it was salty. And as a result, it made me what? It made me thirsty. So, so here, God intends for his followers to live in such a way that others around them are made aware of their spiritual dehydration. In other words, remember a few weeks ago we saw, he saw, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Remember that? Well, the simple truth is that because our thirst for righteousness is being quenched by God, others ought to be able to view our lives and thirst for that which we thirst. I read this week a wonderful story about a businessman who who was the owner of his own business, and through the years he had employed several Christians. And in his own testimony, he said, whenever I hired a Christian, I kind of watched him like a hawk. He wasn't a believer. He said, but I kind of watch them just to see whether they lived out the truths of what they proclaimed to confess. And he said, some did and some didn't, but no one really made an impact on me until one day this guy, one of his employers, asked to meet with him. This businessman said, I knew that this guy was was a fresh convert to Christianity, that not long ago he had given his life to Jesus Christ. And so he writes, he said, you know what? I thought the guy was coming to convert me. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, great, here we go again. Another zealot with the gospel that's coming to convert me. This businessman said this. He said, I was surprised when the man came into my office, his head hanging low, and said to me, sir, I'll only take a few minutes, but I'm here to ask your forgiveness. And the owner said, okay, why? You know, what have you done? And the man said, over the years, I've worked for you. And I've done what a lot of other employees have done. I've borrowed things from the office. Not, not big things, but here and there, I've taken a notebook. I've taken, you know, different things from the office. I've borrowed them. I also need to confess to you that I've abused phone privileges. And I've cheated the time clock now and then. And the man says, but I want you to know that recently I became a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm convicted of that. And so today, I not only ask your forgiveness, but I want to make things right. And, and I realize that if you want to fire me, that that might be the consequences of what I've done. I'm willing to accept that. But I want you to know I'm willing to pay for everything that I've taken from you through the years. If you want me to work overtime, I'll work overtime. If you want to dock my pay, you dock my pay. But I want you to know I want to make it right. I've done wrong. And from this point forward, I just want to make things right between God and between you and me. Here was the business owner's statement. He said this, it was the single most impressive demonstration of Christianity that I have ever witnessed. And as a result, he became a believer. What had happened, this brand new convert lived in such a way that he created a thirst for God in the eyes of of his employer. I sit back and thought, wow, man, what would happen if all of us lived that way? What would happen if every single one of our employers realized, man, there's something different about him. There's something different about her, something that I desire. They're creating thirst in me for God. Here's a second application. As salt, the believer should add flavor Salt adds flavor, does it not? Can, can anybody eat, I mean, without salt? I know I can't, and, and I know my doctor says be careful with the salt, but you know what? Sometimes you just got to have salt, right? I mean, sometimes food is flavorless without salt. Well, 
like salt, you and I add flavor. What, what does that mean? Well, we add divine flavor to the world. And as I thought through that, I thought, wow, that's exactly what Jesus is saying in this passage. Because over and over again, you'll remember he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are, and we know that the word blessed means happy, a happiness that is not dependent upon our circumstances, but a happiness that transcends our circumstances. In other words, it's an inner joy that we express and we demonstrate no matter what happens in our life. And people see that. And what we realize, man, there is something different about him or her. Something that I desire, a divine flavor that I want in my life. Man, you and I add joy. At least I hope we do. We add joy to a depressing world. The, the third thing, and many believe that it's the primary meaning of Jesus in the passage, as salt, the believer should preserve. As salt, we are called to preserve. Christians are a preserving influence in the world. As representatives of God on earth, we slow down moral and spiritual corruption. Could you imagine what the world would be like if all of a sudden all the believers were taken out? What would your job be like if all of a sudden all of the believers were taken out? What would South Florida be like if all of a sudden all of the believers were taken out? There, there was no salt in South Florida. You see, as believers, we, we preserve. We, we put a break on immorality, on unrighteousness, on incorrect communication. Have you ever had this? I trust that you have. You walk in the break room at work, and when you walk in, everybody's just talk, 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 and all of a sudden you walk in, everybody's silent. And you first of all think, oh my word, they're talking about me, all right? They're talking about me, and they probably were talking about you, all right? That's happened to me, all of a sudden, oh, here, the pastor came in the room, we gotta change the conversation. We can't be talking about what we were talking about before. Listen, you ought to live in such a way that your presence stops immorality. That, that your presence causes people to live differently. That your presence causes people to act and talk differently. Why is that? Because you or the salt of the earth. It doesn't say you walk in and say, okay, no more swearing around me, all right? Okay, no more dirty jokes around me. We don't see any evidence that you have to declare that. It's by your life. It's by what you're living, what you exude. President Calvin Coolidge tells the story that he was sitting in a barber shop one day, and as he, as he sat down in the barber shop, he could sense... The, the presence of an individual in the shop, almost as if there was a person of importance there. And he could talk about the way that people talked and the way that people responded. He could tell there was something different as he was getting his hair cut. And, and he noticed that the person that was sitting in the chair beside him stood up and left. And he realized that that person was none other than the great preacher D.L. Moody. Even in the barber shop, D.L. Moody's influence pervaded the environment, so much so that President Calvin Coolidge recognized a difference. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says, you and I, we are the salt of the earth. Notice the second metaphor that Jesus mentions. Not only are we the salt of the earth, but we are light. We are the light of the world. Now, think with me, while salt is hidden, light is obvious. Salt works secretly, but light works openly. Salt works with, with, from within, while light works from without. Salt is the indirect influence of the gospel, while light is more of a direct communication. Notice that Jesus says two things about us functioning as light. Notice verse 14, notice what he says. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. What is it that Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying this, that you and I should live in such a way that everyone can see 
the light. Here's what Jesus is saying. Live your Christianity out loud. Live your Christianity on your sleeve, not in an obnoxious way, but live in such a way that your light, actually the light of Jesus Christ, can shine through you. Live in such a way that everyone knows that you are a believer. And catch this, because it's really obvious in the text. He doesn't say, talk like salt. He doesn't say, talk like light. He's talking about our character. He's talking about our person. He's talking about the way that we act. We live in such a way that the light of Jesus Christ shines through us. If you're living out the principles of the Beatitudes, you don't have to carry a great big sign that says, I am a believer. If you're living out the principles of principles of the Beatitudes, you don't have to carry this huge Bible to work. And I, I'm not against anybody carrying their Bible to work, but you don't have to have these outward signs and manifestations that you're a believer. Everyone knows that you're a believer by the way that you live, by the way that you act, and by the way that you respond. Your actions are evident to all. Notice verse 16 says, they will see your good works. So second thing that I wrote in your outline, live in a way that the light of the gospel is not hid. Jesus says it this way in verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Here's what he's saying, to be a secret Christian is absurd. You don't say, hey, give me a flashlight and then cover the flashlight in a dark room, right? If you cover the light, the light is not working. So Jesus is saying, why do we who have the light of the gospel within us at times cover the truth of the gospel with our actions? Did you ever sing this song when you were a kid? Some of you did. This little light of mine I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I don't know how the rest of it goes, something like that, but, but I know it. Then it goes, uh, then it goes, hide it under a bushel. Oh, come on, you know that. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. What's the idea? I, I mean, we teach boys and girls the idea is what? Let your light shine. Don't cover up the light. So let me ask you, this last week, did you cover your light? Did, did your actions, did your responses reflect the light of Jesus Christ through what you did? Or did you cover it up? You see, lights are to be are to illuminate, not to be hidden. Lights are to be displayed and not covered. Hey, let me do a promo here. Has anybody ever seen Greg and Lynn's house at Christmas? Hey, hey, Greg, kind of lay, Greg, Greg's being shy. If you haven't seen Greg and Lynn's house at Christmas, you need to go to Greg and Lynn's house at Christmas because they have, I think, three million lights or something like that. I don't know what it is. I mean, there are all kinds of lights at their house. Now, could you imagine, and Greg spends, I, I think, a couple of weeks putting up the lights, getting ready for Christmas. Could you imagine if Greg did all of that work and have all the lights up and then say, boy, you know what? I'm not going to turn those lights on. I think it looks good during the daytime. All right, without turning the lights on. That would be crazy, what, right? Why? Lights are to illuminate. Lights that don't light don't fulfill their function. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. Don't cover up your lights. Let your light so shine brightly. Here's what Jesus is saying. You and I have influence. We were left here for the purpose of influencing others. Let me show you one other thing, and I'm done. Jesus says, shows the results as well. And here's what he says with the, with the results. He says, your testimony matters, 
and my testimony matters. Jump back to verse 13 and notice what Jesus says. He says, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, for us, it's difficult to, concept, or to grab that concept because we go to Publix and we buy a little can or whatever it is of Morton salt, and Morton salt always works for us, right? At least I think it does. But put yourself in New Testament times where there wasn't a Publix, there wasn't a Walmart super center, and you had to go out and either buy salt that had been dug out or you yourself had to go close to the Dead Sea and you had to dig out your own salt. There was a good chance that the salt that you had dug or that you had purchased had been contaminated by gypsum and other minerals that made the salt taste flat and made the salt taste repulsive. In other words, you would purchase the salt that doesn't have the taste of salt. And because it doesn't have the taste of salt, it's no longer good. And so they would take that useless, worthless salt, and they would throw it out. They just couldn't throw it out anywhere, because if they threw it in the garden, it would kill the plants. And so they threw it on the pathways, and they threw it on the road, so that as people walked over it, it would just be ground into the dirt. In other words, that salt that they had pur purchased had become useless. Here's what Jesus says, unsalty salt is not good for anything. I wrote it this way in your notes, a lack of saltiness, or a lack of saltiness, correct, makes your testimony worthless. Catch that, church. A lack of saltiness makes your testimony worthless worthless. I just spoke in the Spanish congregation a few moments ago, and, and the Spanish is so, I love how it's said, because it's so specific, because it uses this phrase, good for nothing. <laughs> and so it says, that salt that doesn't have saltiness is good for nothing. In other words, it's not accomplishing its purpose. Now, Jesus is using that metaphor to talk about us. And he's saying that a believer who has been left in the world for the purpose of being salty, and yet who, because of their actions, because of their words, because of their lifestyle, is no longer salty, Jesus says, for the cause of Christ, that person is worthless. That person is good for Nothing. Now, not the person is good for nothing, but their testimony, what they're trying to accomplish is good for nothing. Jesus is saying, make sure that you're salt. Make sure that your life is salty. All right, let me give you one last one. The last one is this. A brilliant light prompts the world to do two things. First of all, they take notice of your good works. Notice verse 15 once again. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good works. It's really interesting. The word good in the passage there doesn't mean intrinsically good. It means beautiful. In other words, so they may see the beauty of your good works and not glorify you, but rather glorify your Father, which is in heaven. In other words, I live in such a way that my, my life reflects the light of Jesus Christ, and it glorifies God. Simple illustration, we use this all the time. You know that the moon has no intrinsic light of his own. The moon is only a reflector of the sun's life, light. Sometimes we look at the moon and we say, man, how beautiful is that? And it is beautiful, but it's only beautiful as it reflects the light of the sun. And when it doesn't reflect the light of the sun, there's no real intrinsic beauty there unless you like craters and all of that other kind of stuff. What's the idea? The idea is this, you and I have been saved We've been redeemed. We've been given so many blessings. Why is that? 
so that we can reflect the light of Jesus Christ through our works and that others will not only see a life that's been changed in us, but they'll glorify our Father, which is in heaven. So here's my question today. Are you salt? Are you functioning like salt? Are you light? Are you reflecting the truth of the gospel through your life? I sit back and think, man, what would happen, God, what would happen if 500 people from Hollywood Community Church would leave out of here determined this week, I want to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. I want my words. I want my actions. I want everything I do to point people toward Jesus. Wow, do you think we could impact this world that's getting not better but getting worse? May God help us to live that out in our lives.